Okay, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Kave, and uh, I'm an assistant professor at the FUSEC group in Amsterdam. And uh, today I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, all the insecurities that you have, we have in our hardware and how can we actually still build secure systems while we make the assumption that maybe the hardware is not uh, very secure. Um, so in Amsterdam, we are actually, we have become quite big. We are a group of about 20 people and uh, we do research in a lot of different topics. So, you know, we build uh, things, uh, software protection. So, you know, we go and change the compiler so that to make it harder uh, for attackers to compromise software vulnerabilities. Right. Uh, we do uh, research in binary and malware analysis. And uh, these days we do quite a bit of fuzzing. So, you know, uh, this is quite hot at the moment in the community. So we try to come up with uh, a new fuzzing approaches that, uh, that, uh, that are efficient in finding uh, various uh, vulnerabilities in software and also in hardware these days. We do also some uh, network security. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about uh, some hardware and operating system security that we have been doing uh, in Amsterdam in the past uh, five years or so. So this is an overview of the, all the research that we have been doing. So it is more uh, high level. And you know, if you have more questions about a very specific one, please feel free to, to ask me. So in the last uh, part, you know, the overarching research question is that, you know, imagine this perfect world, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 20 years from now, where we have managed to formally verify all the software. So we know that uh, there is no issue in software. And the question that uh, we try to ask ourselves is that if we make that assumption, what could uh, the attackers still do? So, and uh, what can we do about it? So this is like maybe this uh, imaginary future. Although so most of the attacks that I present to you are actually quite real. You can even do them today. Uh, okay, so, and, uh, this is, so this question, I, I think like it started this field of uh, what I call the general purpose hardware attacks. So for the past five years or so, you know, people have been doing attacks on hardware for quite some time now, right? You know, uh, whenever you want to build a smart uh, card, uh, you know, you do a lot of research to make sure that you cannot leak uh, the, the crypto key, for example, that you have in your smart card. But with the general purpose uh, uh, hardware components, I mean things like DRAM, uh, you know, and CPU. And these are the components that are in almost all computing devices that, uh, you know, we carry around like laptops. Uh, mobile phones, but also, you know, in the clouds, in the servers, uh, uh, you also find these components. Now, what is possible? What have we found? Uh, so I was part of the team that did this uh, attack uh, called Drummer. You might have uh, heard about this. Uh, and this showed that, you know, using uh, issues in DRAM, you could actually compromise phones. You could get root uh, if you're an untrusted app on, the, on an Android phone. Uh, and, you know, if you've been following the news, uh, there was, uh, you know, in 2018, uh, there was the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities uh, that, that showed that, you know, there are issues at the core of uh, CPUs uh, that, uh, that are deployed everywhere that allows you to leak uh, secret information from them. So this shocked the, the, the CPU industry. Last year, we also disclosed the MDS uh, class of vulnerabilities that is, goes in the same class uh, as, that are called the speculative execution that showed that uh, even though there are a lot of uh, defenses deployed, you could still do this type of attacks. I'm going to also briefly cover that. Uh, so, and you might say, okay, these are all nice and academic. Do we care in the real world? I come from industry, should I worry about these things? Uh, and to answer that question, you know, I refer you to this tweet that I found. This is from uh, Immunity uh, uh, Security. So they're like a developer of Canvas. So, you know, they, they build this exploitation pack. You go and pay, you know, 20, $30,000, and then you get this exploitation pack. And then you can just try it if you're a pen tester, you know, to, to actually compromise uh, systems or, you know, if you're a hacker. And they showed that uh, using a Spectre, they could leak the content of uh, ETC Shadow. So this shows that, you know, in, uh, actually in the, in the world, people might be using this. Thing. And since I was part of uh, this drummer, I know that the, a government entity at some point were asking, uh, could we please have access to the exploit that you've developed? We, we need it in an investigation case. And you know, like we are an academic group, we of course said no, uh, but uh, you know, this shows that governments may also be interested in this type of attacks. Uh, okay, but uh, from an academic point of view, what is interested? You know, we've been doing now security for quite some time, right? So wh why should we worry about these things academically? And I think there are three things that are uh, different uh, when you think about this type of issue. So the first one is that uh, the attacks are not immediately obvious what you can do with them. The impacts are not clear. First of all, it's not clear what you can do. 
And second, it's not also clear that, OK, if the attack is possible, what is the impact of this attack? So to give you an example, so with the uh, mobile, with the bit flip issues that, that we found, you know, originally when they were discovered, people said that, OK, so maybe you can flip a bit somewhere. You know, maybe you can crash a system. So maybe we shouldn't worry about this so much. But then, you know, we did a few years of research to show that actually the entire security of the system relies on a single bit if you can manage to move data around in the system. So then it shows that maybe you should worry about this. So that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that, you know, unlike software problems, you know, when you have a software problem, oftentimes say you miss the bounce check, you go and fix you, the code, one line, and then the problem is, is solved, right? But with hardware problem, with some of these problems, they're very structural. So these are like fundamental assumptions that we have made. You know, things like a speculative execution. So this is something, something that you need to build any high performance out of order CPU core. So you cannot just simply turn it off, right? So it makes it uh, very challenging uh, to deal with this problem. Also very interesting from an academic point of view. Uh, and the last one that is perhaps like more closer, uh, you know, you could actually feel it, is that you cannot really update hardware. You know, with, uh, we have developed this mechanism, this software update mechanism. You know, every few days you get this notification that you now need to update your system, you know, to get all the recent uh, security patches. But hardware is something that is very tangible, right? So, you know, I have a Pixel 3 phone in my hand, right? I know that this has bit flips. Right? And there is nothing I can do to fix this. You know, maybe I could go and you know, open it up and change the DRAM chip inside of this phone. But maybe I can do that, but you know, an average user cannot do this. So this also makes it difficult uh, to deal with these uh, problems after you know, we have found them. So I, mean, I think all of these things make this uh, quite an interesting domain uh, to work in. Uh, so how do we do this? So how do we uh, you know, go around and try to understand how should we defend systems? And what we do is that we try to first you know, uh, explore the attack surface. We look for novel ways of uh, breaking into systems. You know, we think about what may be possible. And then you know, we run a lot of experiments. Uh, sometimes we do fuzzing right, to try to find issues. And oftentimes, this uh, leads to discovery of new attacks. So once we have uh, done this, you know, we look at whether people uh, have already thought about these attacks. Maybe there are defenses already proposed. So we look at, we try to assess the existing defenses that, uh, that are out there, maybe deployed in systems. Uh, and if they're not good enough, uh, we go and try to build new novel defenses to try to protect against these attacks that we have discovered. I know this is like an arms race, right? So we repeat this many, many times until we are happy that, okay, the system is uh, secure enough. So and uh, we have done this in two uh, directions uh, uh, in Amsterdam. So the first one is what I call DRAM-based uh, corruptions, or you might know it as uh, Rohammer. Uh, and this allows you to trigger bit flips inside uh, DRAM, inside memory. And then the second direction is uh, uh, hardware-based information leakage. You know, things like the timing of operations leak some secret information from your, from your computing device. So these are the two directions that we have been looking into these uh, uh, novel attacks and how to defend against them. And now I'm going to give you some examples for the DRAM part, for the Rohammer part. Uh, OK, so what is uh, Rohammer, if you've not heard of this? Uh, so the, the, the main, the core of the problem is that we have reduced the size of transistors, right? So you know, back in the day, a few megabytes of memory was a lot. But nowadays, you, know, you can just buy a phone, and then you will get a few gigabytes of uh, memory. I mean, the size of the phone hasn't changed that much, right? But you know, the, in the same area, you have now mo much more uh, memory and compute capacity. And this is because we've managed to reduce the size of transistors. So back in the day, you know, uh, and in, in DRAM specifically, uh, to uh, store information, you use uh, what we call capacitors. You store some charge in them, and then this charge, if it is, uh, you know, if you store enough charge, it will be a one bit, and then if you don't store charge, it will be like a zero bit. So back in the day, you could imagine that these, uh, these capacitors be built from these transistors, right? They're big, right? So you needed to store uh, a lot of charge in them to actually denote a value of one or zero. But now, years later, you know, with Moore's law, these transistors have become smaller and smaller, allowing to build you know, faster computers, more memory, right? Uh, which means that you know, now you have many more of these things. So, and then two things, if you just look at this uh, like that, two things have changed, right? So these things have become very small. So it means that you need to store much less charge in them than before. That's one thing. And the other thing is that they're now much, much closer to each other, right? And you know, if you have done uh, 
some electrical engineering courses, you know that when you, when you make uh, uh, transistors or you know, generally any sort of like electronic devices or uh, component close to each other, you start having interference between them. So these researchers back in 2014, they did some experiments and then they realized that you know, if you try to read from uh, this part of uh, memory very quickly, right, some charge will start to leak. You know, if you remember from your high school uh, course, you know, since DRAM is made out of capacitors, these capacitors leak charge over time, right? So every now and then you need to go back and refresh them. You need to make sure that the charge is restored. Now, these researchers showed that, you know, between the DRAM has some chance to restore its charge, if you read very, very quickly from them, because there is very little charge in them, and now they're also very close to each other, some electrons start moving between them. So if you do this fast enough, enough charge will leak before the device can refresh itself that you know, the bit changes its value from one to zero. So from a software point of view, it means that you, know, you wrote some data in memory, right? And then you read very, very quickly from some part of memory, and suddenly you see a bit changing its value from one to zero uh, in some other part of memory. Right? And this is you know, not good. So this is not what DRAM is supposed to do. Right? So if you write some memory, right, then you want you, when you read it back, it should be the same value. But suddenly, because of this vulnerability, it is not, not the same anymore. And you know, they did, uh, the original authors did, did the study. You know, they, did, they bought you know, 100 DIMMs, and then they tried it. And then they figured out that 87% of everything that is deployed at that time uh, is actually vulnerable to this uh, this. this, this. And then, uh, you know, there were also later some research on DDR4 that showed that they also suffer from some of uh, these issues. So what can we do about this? So how would you exploit these things, right? So back when the paper was published, you know, they didn't really show an actual exploit because it's actually quite hard uh, to exploit this system. With lots of these software attacks that oftentimes we discuss, you know, buffer overflows, use after freeze, uh, you know, you ha software has quite a bit of control. Oftentimes you can corrupt multiple bytes, you know exactly where the corruption happens. But the fault model that we have here is quite different. So these faults happen randomly all over memory, so it depends on physical properties of the device at the manufacturing time. So we don't know that beforehand, right? Uh, and also like they're single bit flips, right? So the corruption, you only can corrupt maybe a bit here, a bit there. It's not like you would be able to corrupt multiple bytes in memory. And so this was, you know, already from an academic point of view, this was quite interesting, right? So how would you actually go on and build a reliable exploit? Because if you could actually build an exploit, then you have to worry about this, right? So this is uh, something that we looked at, uh, uh, the first thing that we looked at, and we came up with this uh, methodology that, you know, if you follow, you could actually use these uh, bit flips to compromise systems. And the methodology follows three, three steps, right? So in the first step, which we call templating, uh, you know, the attacker would go around memory and try to find out where these bit flips are because it is not clear if you have that computer that bit flip will be at that location, right? So you have to actually go around and check for these bit flips. So you go around and look, you, you know, read a lot from memory and check whether you have bit flips or not. And you do this a lot, maybe depending on how bad the situation is for your computer, it could take maybe less than a second or maybe it could take minutes. But after a while, you will find a location in memory that you could flip a bit, you know? You check, and then you suddenly see that a value of zero is read instead of one. And then you know that, okay, you have a, a bit, a cell in memory that is vulnerable to this, this problem. Okay, so once you've done that, the attacker would go into the second stage. And this stage is what we call memory massaging. So the idea is that in memory, you have some piece of sensitive information, right? Uh, and then you want to change, you want to corrupt this piece of sensitive information. So you can think of like, if you, if you are familiar with buffer overflows, for example, memory errors, this means that maybe you want to corrupt the pointer, right? So that pointer would be the sensitive data that you want to corrupt. I will show an example of what else can you corrupt that would be more sensible whenever you have this type of fault. Uh, and in the massaging step, what the attacker tries to do is forcing the system to move this data from that part of memory to the location where the attacker knows there is going to be a bit flip. So this is oftentimes the most complicated part of the attack, forcing the system to store some sensitive information in the location where there is a bit flip. Once that is done, the attacker would move to the third part of the, the last part of the attack, 
and I would re-trigger the vulnerability. And then this time, this bit flip would corrupt this piece of information. Typically, if you would try to write to this directly, because of the security mechanisms that are implemented in the CPUs, oftentimes this is not allowed, right? You would get a page fault, or you cannot do this to begin with. But here, this fault is happening in DRAM, right? So the CPU and the applications that are running on top are completely unaware of this happening. So because of this, the data gets corrupted without the system realizing it. Okay, so this we called the flip uh, feng shui. Uh, feng shui is the art of moving objects around so that you know things become peaceful and nice, right? And here, flip feng shui means that you know you try to do something nice with the flips so that actually when you trigger them, you could actually corrupt some some nice data that uh, that the attacker wants. Uh, okay, so let's look at an example of how we use this technique to uh, to co uh, to compromise a cloud VM. So the threat model here is that. Uh, you have a server which is running a lot of VMs, and uh, you know you would go and put on put down your credit card, and you can actually allocate one VM in this this cloud, right? This this server which has a lot of other VMs, and as an attacker, your aim is to compromise one of these VMs that is running there. All right, okay. So in the so here we have the attacker VM which is trying to compromise this weak VM. So for the templating part, what the attacker would do is uh, is hammering. Uh, the, the memory of that, that has been allocated to its VM, right? So you just the attacker would just go around its own memory looking for these bit flips. And at some point, the attacker will find such a bit flip. Uh, okay, so this part, the first one is easy, right? So the question is that, how, okay, so now the attacker has found a bit flip in the memory, and now the aim of the attacker is to force the victim VM to store some sensitive information uh, in, a, in a location where the bit flip has been found. And for this, we use the feature that is called memory deduplication uh, that is common uh, in uh, some cloud uh, platforms. And the idea is that uh, with memory deduplication, uh, with clouds, you have a lot of VMs. And you know uh, you, they're all running Windows, or they're all running Linux. And many of them maybe are running Apache or Memcached. So there is a lot of duplication in these clouds, right, in these servers. So ideally, you want to only keep one copy of the information, right, instead of duplicating all this information and waste all of this memory. And this is where this memory duplication comes into play. So uh, the idea is that you know, your victim has stored some uh, piece of information in memory, right? And uh, you know, the attacker, what the attacker would do, you know, this is the location where the bit flip has been found, would store the same information right, that the attacker wants to corrupt in that location. Right? Now the memory duplication process in the background goes and looks at pages that have the same content, right? And at some point, it will realize, the, 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 the hypervisor that is implementing this, that this is actually the same information. I would basically deduplicate this information so that you would only have one copy of this. I would release this, this page back to the system. Of course, you want to preserve correct semantic. So typically, this means that this page now needs to be Read only, so it cannot be written by both because then you don't have consistency in your system. So, and then if one of the parties try to write to this page, you get a page fault, and then you again reduplicate this page so that the correct semantic is preserved. But now with Rohammer, you can corrupt this in memory. So we are basically breaking the copy and write mechanism of that is implemented to make sure that you know you get consistency uh, in memory. Okay, so this is the the premise of the attack. And now we could you know, trigger these bit flips and corrupt this page. Now, at this point, I ask a question from the audience. So now you know the parameters of the attack, right? So you, you can corrupt a page of a victim VM that you know the content. What would you target? Anybody has any idea? So you know you could, you know, this is cl close to Christmas, you know, maybe Santa gives you a gift that you can trigger a bit flip in a page of a victim VM that you know the content. What would you, what would you target? Anybody? Do I see somebody? Yes. Hmm? What? Cryptographic keys. Very good, very good. You're very, very good. So you know, it took us a few days to figure this out. <laughs> uh, yes, so we targeted uh, uh, RSA public keys. 
And there is a reason why we did that. So we tried to we basically compromise OpenSSH. Uh, and the reason is that you know these public keys, you know, whenever you try to SSH, the OpenSSH server would bring it, would bring these public keys to the memory, right? And memory is something that you cannot trust anymore. So that's that's nice. And the other thing is that these public keys oftentimes are very long. So you, they, they, they get stored in a lot of bytes in memory, so which gives you a lot of chance to actually flip any of the bits in these, in these bytes. So that's quite nice. Uh, but what does it mean to uh, trigger a bit flip in a public key? Uh, so I, I'm not a cryptographer, you know, unlike the talk this morning, so I don't know exactly what, uh, what this would mean. Uh, so I went and talked with one of uh, the people that, that we knew that knew cryptography. And then uh, what, he did some analysis for us, and then he told us that if you trigger a bit flip in the public key of your SSH, then it becomes quite easy to, to factorize it. So oftentimes, you know, if you do, if you know a little bit about RSA, oftentimes you have these two uh, large primes, and then you multiply these primes, and from that you derive your public key and your private key. And uh, you rely on the fact that factorizing this uh, public key to these uh, two primes is very, very difficult. Uh, but with the flip Feng Shui attack, now you get a public key that is one bit different uh, from this original public key, right? And then what uh, he did the analysis for us, and then we later implemented this attack, and we figured out that, that uh, once you get this bit flip, suddenly this, uh, this public key is not a result of the f a factor of uh, the multiplication of these two big primes, primes, but actually it becomes a multiplication of many, many primes. And some of them are smaller than the others. And this means that we can you know, do the factorization much, much easier. So instead of you know, needing like, maybe like, uh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of years, Suddenly, we could do this you know, in a matter of minutes. So we went on and implemented this attack. You know, and then this is the result of uh, the attacks that we did. So you know, we started 200 VMs. You know, we triggered the bit. We generated new public keys. You know, we triggered the bit flip. And we saw whether we could compromise them or not. And here you can see the result. So on the Y, we have the CDF, the success rate of the attack of these 200 attempts that we made. And then on the X axis, we have the, um, the attack time in minutes. So as you know, we go forward, we expect that more and more of these attacks become successful, you know, depending on where the public key lands and how difficult it is to factorize it. And you can see that you know, around 10 minutes, we already achieved more than 80% of uh, success rate. So this shows that this was the first attack that was deterministic and reliable. Right? So it shows that using these bit flips, you, know, you actually have to be worried that you know, people might actually abuse them to, to break into systems. Uh, so this was the flip Feng Shui attack. And at the same time, um, we were also thinking of whether we could do this on other systems. One of the interesting, more interesting cases was whether you can do this on ARM. And uh, you know, uh, the, this, the, the information about these bit flips were public already for two years, but nobody had managed yet to show that they could do this on mobile phones. Mostly because uh, you know, there, are, there were some uh, issues with triggering, uh, with being able to access memory very, very quickly. Uh, so the instruction, the ARM caches, so you typically have your CPU. Whenever you want to read from memory, first you go to your caches that are in between your memory and your CPU. And these caches, you know, they observe most of your memory requests. And flushing these caches on ARM platforms turned out to be really slow. And because of that, uh, nobody had managed to show that you can actually do this on mobile phones. Uh, so we, you know, we worked on this for, uh, uh, for months, and trying to figure out many different ways to do this. We were about to give up, right? So this close to giving up, that they finally found this uh, this library on uh, on Android that allows you to allocate uh, what we call DMA memory in user space. So if you're an app, uh, you can allocate uh, direct memory. Uh, so this is the memory that you use to communicate with your devices, and this memory is uh, uncached. So which means that you could you don't have to worry about the caches anymore. You do every request that you send directly goes to memory. So this becomes the perfect library for doing raw hammer on mobile phones. Uh, so we, we use this to trigger these bit flips, and we found out that, OK, so using this, you can actually trigger a lot of bit flips. Uh, we found out that there is no deduplication on most of the phones that we tried, so we could not really use uh, deduplication. But here we used uh, some properties of the memory allocator, the body allocator in Linux. So I'm not going to explain the details. If you want to know, go read the paper. It's a seven-step algorithm that shows how you could actually land uh, the page that you want in a location that has bit flips. 
And to exploit that, uh, we use the uh, we use page tables. So page tables are this info, uh, this data structure that tells your CPU where, uh, if, uh, where whenever you have a virtual memory, where you should go uh, in physical memory to find that information. And by corrupting this, you can get access to the entire physical memory of the, the machine. So using this, we built uh, an exploit. This is the drummer attack that I uh, originally showed you in the beginning. And we tried this on 27 phones. And then I'm going to show you some results. So um, we had, uh, you know, we tried this on many different phones. On some of these phones, uh, we found many, many bit flips. So uh, about 1 million bit flips. It means that, you know, once you find them, you cannot blacklist them. Because if you blacklist them, you would blackli blacklist all of the memory that you have in your phone. So this is not really feasible, right? In some others, uh, we didn't find any bit flips. We later found out that if you have a phone, uh, that you have, uh, it could have a different memory chip from a different vendor, so it depends on your luck. So if you're unlucky, you have a lot of bit flips, and then if you're, uh, if not, then you don't have any. Um, and uh, yeah, so depending on how, how many you can trigger, it would take you maybe a second to actually find one that you can exploit, right? Or maybe it takes you up to half an hour, so if you're, uh, if you're as an attacker, unlucky. But after you find one that is exploitable, it usually takes you about 22 seconds to actually get root on the, on the phone. So you know you install an app, right? And then if the app is malicious, after 22 seconds, the app can get root on the phone. Uh, and then later, you know, we did also more research and showed that you could also do this uh, in the browser, so you know, in JavaScript. So if you, know, if you see an ad that is, uh, that is doing this attack, then you could potentially uh, compromise the browser using the same type of attack. Uh, so this was a, a paper that we published at Security and Privacy in 2018 that showed that this is possible. Uh, and so, you know, every time we find this, uh, these issues, we go and talk with the vendors and try to get them to fix these things, right? Because at the end of the day, our aim is not to build exploits. You know, we want to improve the state of the world. So we go and talk with the vendors and try to get them to fix these things. And most of the times, the response that we get is that uh, we will disable that feature that you used to make your exploit work. Uh, so it's what we call a spot mitigation. So for example, Google disabled uh, part of the, uh, the allocator that we use to get DMA memory. But of course, they couldn't disable all of it because otherwise uh, many of the applications in the phone wouldn't work. Um, and also Microsoft and cloud providers that we talked to, they decided to turn memory deduplication off because it would allow you to do this type of attacks. And uh, you know, this was something that I wasn't used to, but whenever we also did this, you know, every now and then a reporter would try to call and ask, okay, so what did you do? And then, you know, you suddenly have to be able to explain these things in languages that people understand, you know, and by that, I mean, they don't know much about computer science, and then you have to explain it. It's an interesting experience. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so they, they, uh, they would oftentimes be interested and would write, you know, articles about uh, these, these attacks that, uh, that we did. And we also got uh, a Pony Award, so and this is also... Uh, some silly award that they give at the Black Hat conference. That was also interesting. Uh, so this was the attacks. Uh, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about defenses. So what can we do to actually, uh, what, what, do, what do other companies do or other people do? And what did we do at the end to try to protect against this? this, this. Uh, so the, the things that uh, the companies uh, proposed was disabling this feature. So uh, the disabling the duplication would stop the massaging part of the attack, right? So once uh, you don't have memory duplication, you cannot move the data that you want in a location that has bit flips, right? And then if you don't have the contiguous heap, you cannot do the, the, the templating part. Um, and uh, so these, we think, are, these are very expensive, right? So imagine disabling memory deduplication. So we measure this, right? So in some certain setting, if you have memory deduplication on, it would allow you to save 50% of memory, right? Imagine disabling that and suddenly, you know, you lose half of your revenue if you're a cloud provider and you're packing a lot of VMs, right? So this is very expensive and also not very secure. So for example, Drummer already showed that you don't need memory duplication in certain settings. So you could do the attack without memory duplication. And also uh, we showed that, you know, with, uh, with another attack that we did after Drummer, that even without this uh, specific uh, uh, ion heap, we could do the attack with similar heaps that are available inside uh, Android. So, you know, they would stop that specific exploit that we developed, but they wouldn't stop uh, the attack. 
uh, in, in its core. Uh, so, you know, as some of you here might say, you know, you're talking about all these uh, hardware attacks. Why are you trying to fix this in software? Why not uh, do like, uh, it, it needs to be fixed in hardware? Which is true in a sense, except that it is also quite difficult uh, to fix it in hardware. I'm gonna tell you why. So one of the, every time I, I give a talk, you know, there is always a question at some point from the audience that would, that would be, uh, wouldn't ECC fix this problem? So ECC, if you don't know, is error correcting codes that, you know, if you buy a very expensive server, you oftentimes get this. And the question is that, okay, so maybe there, you, we wouldn't need to worry about this. And then there is also a mitigation that is called uh, TRR uh, that, is that is developed specifically to fix Brohammer. And the idea there is that you know you try to look at uh, which rows uh, in memory are getting uh, activated very frequently. You keep track of them, and then you try to refresh rows that are close to them to avoid uh, triggering these bit flips. Uh, and I'm going to briefly talk about uh, these things. So first, I would we would talk about uh, uh, ECC. I would talk about ECC. Uh, so the original paper um, already showed that uh, uh, the most basic form of ECC, which is single error correction uh, and dub, uh, double error detection, is not enough because you would trigger enough bit flips in a simple memory word that would overwhelm the code. So they, they already discussed that this is probably not enough, right? But uh, so we tried to do this already, you know, back in 2016, and it turned out to be really difficult. And the reason for that is the following. So here you have your cores, right? And here you have your DRAM. And uh, if you look at a, a memory module that has ECC support, you realize that, okay, so, you know, normal memory has maybe eight chips. Uh, and then you would find that uh, on ECC DIMM, you have a ninth chip. So the only difference between a normal DIMM and an ECC DIMM is that it has a chip extra or a few chips extra. And it is the job of this memory controller to make, you, to make use of this extra chip to store some redundant information, some ECC information, right? And of course, this implementation is closed, right? So this is something that AMD knows, this is something that Intel knows, but this is not something that we know, right? And if you don't know exactly what they're doing uh, to, to encode this uh, uh, extra redundant information, you don't know how to actually exploit it. So this is the first hurdle right, that we had. The second hurdle is that uh, if you have a single bit flip, you don't see it anymore. Right? Because the system would automatically fix it. So you cannot trigger a single bit flip. And then if you trigger two bit flips, the system would crash, right? Because the, uh, the, the code would be able to detect that you triggered two errors. So the system, it realizes that it is in an inconsistent state and it oftentimes shuts down the system. And so you need to trigger three bit flips to be able to trigger silent corruptions. And the chance that you would get a three bit flips is very, very lower than triggering two or a single bit flips. So which means that even if you could figure out this uh, ECC implementation, it's gonna be quite difficult to exploit, right? And all of this, you know, we were, you know, every time we were doing research, we were also talking with the vendors and they were saying, yeah, we have ECC. It's, uh, it's a practical secure defense. We don't need to worry about this, right? And of course we knew that this was not true, right? Because uh, they already had shown that this is probably not good enough. But over the years, this message has started getting lost. So, you know, we started investing more in showing that actually, you know, you need to worry about this even if you have ECC. Uh, so, but this, you know, turned out to be a, a very difficult research. So we spent two years on this, right? Two different PhD students worked on this. One of them gave up after a year. So this, <laughs> this, was, this was a lot of work. But at the end, we managed to get something out of it. So, and the, the main problem was that observing signals at, uh, at more than one gigahertz is not very easy. You know, if you've done uh, like uh, some signal uh, uh, processing, trying to look at uh, digital signals and these kind of things, you, will, uh, you know that, okay, once you go to these higher speeds, you know, you need very expensive equipment, right? And at the, our university, we didn't have money to buy like $100,000 a scope, right? So we, uh, we needed to, to think of something else. It's also, even if you have the, the scope, you need oftentimes these custom interposers, right? Because you need to put something in between your, uh, your DRAM and the, uh, and the device, uh, the, that the probes that you have, and then you need to build it from scratch yourself. And this also is a lot of effort. You can buy it, but it's also very expensive. Um, so we had to get a bit creative. Uh, so at the end, we ended up uh, doing fault injection with uh, some syringe needles. So instead of uh, $100,000, we did this with $2. Right? And then uh, the idea, the thing that allowed us to do this, we were lucky, uh, was that if you look at uh, a DIMM, 
uh, you will see that almost next to every pin that you have, you have a ground signal. So you could short this uh, signal, uh, this, uh, this, this bit line with the ground, and then if the value that is being transmitted on that bit line is one, you get a pull down, you get a one to zero bit flip, right? So we have this now, this very basic primitives that allows us to check whether the memory controller on a line send a one or a zero. And then using this, and then, you know, if we did that, you know, we get a report that an ECC error happened. And using this information, we could reverse engineer what the memory controller was doing. But you could imagine how much, how painful this was, right? So this is a very, you know, manual process. And then, you know, things uh, don't always work out. You know, sometimes we break uh, systems. So this was very painful. But we managed to actually reverse engineer this with some maths. And I actually have a video that I will show in a bit about this. Uh, so this was... So after doing this, we could figure out what the memory controller is sending on the, on the bus. Uh, and this is the result of it. So we tried it on different uh, AMD and Intel systems. And basically, it told us what, how the bit flips should look like for us to get silent corruptions. So for example, in the default case of this Intel system, we realized that we need to find to trigger only two bit flips. So it is apparently not reporting uh, the double errors. In some other cases, we found out that, OK, so we need to trigger four bit flips but they need to be in 16 bytes that are close to each other. So these are the, the patterns that, that we need. And then uh, we got a DIMM that had bit flips, and then we found out that uh, using these bit flips, it is actually possible to still trigger silent corruptions using 0.12% of, for example, uh, these, these bit flips, right? So it is stopping almost all of them, but there is still this small number of bit flips that would, you know, that would still be able to trigger silent corruptions. So this was good news. So we knew that uh, we could actually trigger this. But the question was how, uh, was how. Remember that we still have this problem that if we try to trigger bit flips, the system would crash, right? Because the chance that we would trigger a bit flip is uh, that our two bit flips uh, is, is uh, much higher than three bit flips. Fortunately, while doing this research, we also, find another, we also found another property that allowed us to make it, uh, make it possible. And then the idea here is that if you trigger a bit flip, the system suddenly becomes much, much slow, which also makes sense, right? So if, you, uh, if your memory controller realizes that you have a bit flip, suddenly it has to do more, right? So it has to fix the issue. It has to inform the operating system that the bit flip has happened. So you actually would know whether you triggered the bit flip or not. So this is a timing side channel, right? So depending on whether a memory access is fast or slow, you can figure out whether you triggered the bit flip or not. And this is what this experiment shows, that if you don't have an error, things are really fast. 107 cycles or so, but if we have bit flips, suddenly it would take you know more than 100,000 cycles. So using this very basic primitive, we could just tr try to trigger, trigger single bit flips. So we write patterns that would only cause one bit flip, right? And then later on, we try to merge all of them together to actually be able to do exploitation. So we detect these single bit flips and then later merge them. So people really like this. So we got uh, an award last year at the conference. Uh, and yeah, so this actually paid off. So the PhD student finally graduated, and he's now happy working for Microsoft. And, uh, let me show you uh, actually how this looks like in practice. So here you can see like the, the actual syringe like on the that is trying to short the signals on, on the team. So here we are running mem, mem test that is uh, trying to check whether you have uh, bit flips uh, in memory or not. So this is running in the background all the time, checking memory. And so right now it is, it hasn't, uh, it's not reporting anything. And now he's shorting this. Uh, so the system is running, huh? So he's shorting this, uh, these, these lines. And suddenly here you will see some of these uh, bit flips, uh, these errors uh, appearing. And this is how the, the probe actually looks. A very scientific tool that we use to do this research. All right. So this was ECC. How about uh, TRR? Uh, it's not uh, deployed everywhere, or so we thought. And some of the implementations turned out to be insecure. 
So I'm going to tell you something. So next week, we're going to release more information about this. So this is also something that we've been working on uh, for, uh, for more than actually two years. So we also have some idea of the guarantees that this uh, mitigation provides. Uh, OK, so it looks like hardware defenses uh, also do not uh, provide you with protection. So what can we do? Can we actually produce, uh, do have, have a mitigations uh, with the interfaces, with the hardware we already have today? Can we fix the problem in software? Right, but maybe in a more fundamental way than just disabling features. This is a question that, uh, question that we were asking ourselves. And uh, so to do that, uh, you know, you have to we start thinking about uh, the fault model of Rohammer. And what we realize is that these bit flips oftentimes uh, affect adjacent rows. Right? So if you hammer one row, the data that is next in the next row would get corrupted. So we were thinking, can we maybe isolate every memory row uh, from the other one? So this was the, the thinking pattern. So we were thinking about the fault model. And, uh, and then this, uh, so at some point, we realized this. You know, so such a basic realization, but you know, it allows you to actually build a system, is that if you, have even, if you think of even rows, by construction, they're isolated from each other. And your odd rows are also isolated from each other, right? So they have e even rows in the middle. So can we build a system that you know, only operates on even rows or odd rows? Right? Then, you have, then you get the mitigation, right? Uh, that would protect you against uh, row hammer with this fault model. So this gave us the idea for a system that we called uh, Zebram or Zebra for a long time for obvious reasons. Uh, and then the idea behind Zebram is that you have your DRAM and then you want to create your uh, odd and even patterns in, in memory. And then if you, so let's say that you don't use odd rows, you only use even rows, right? Then the even rows, it basically creates a safe region inside uh, your, your system. This will be safe memory. And then all the odd rows will be the unsafe region. So this is the, the very basic idea. So can we build a system that works like that? Right? And the answer is yes. So this uh, is the design of uh, Zebram. And we have to answer a bunch of questions to, to make this possible. Right? Uh, so first of all, how would you even allocate odd and even rows? You know, I, I heard that some of you have written operating systems, and I was, uh, I had also written some when I was a student. So, you know, and in my, in my mind, whenever I was thinking of DRAM, I would think of physical memory. So I would expect, you know, if I go from, uh, you know, byte zero in physical memory, I will be in the first DRAM chip. And then, you know, if I go a little bit further, I, I, it will be like, you know, would go to the next chip maybe in DRAM. But in reality, it's actually much more complicated. So there are these hashing functions that try to uh, decide based on the physical address where you would go in your DRAM, right? And then these hashing functions, you know, have been reverse engineered. Some of them we can find in the manuals. But then, long story short, it, it's not as simple as, you know, just taking, uh, picking an odd physical address and it would go to an odd row. We actually need to know these things. So we built an allocator that uses this information to actually tell you if you give it a physical address, it will tell you whether you would, you would go to a odd, an odd row or an even row. This is open source. You can use it. Um, and uh, so the, the second question was that, so how would you actually map these odd and even rows to safe and unsafe regions? If you have written an operating system, right? So you, know, you make an assumption that your memory is contiguous, right? You know, if you go and tell Linux that instead of this from byte 0 to byte 2 gigabyte is your physical memory. Here is, you know, 20,000 regions where you can use. It will scream at you, right? Because, you know, it needs to, it makes a lot of assumptions in terms of uh, uh, the contiguity of the physical memory, right? It does body allocations and these kind of things. And suddenly, you cannot do that anymore. We wanted to build something that is compatible to Linux and Windows and this kind of uh, operating system, legacy system, or, you know, commodity systems that people use. So for that, uh, we used the virtualization uh, extension. So this was also another key insight that made us uh, build something that is backward compatible, right? So with the VM extension, we could basically take any page uh, in the system, and we could basically change the mapping so that the, the guests here would think that everything is contiguous. Right? So we basically take all of this, this, uh, this region, and we would create the nested page tables in a way that it looks contiguous to the, to the, to the guest VM. OK, so at this point, we could declare victory. But the problem is that now you're wasting half of your memory. right? So this is also not nice. So the question that we were asking was, can we actually use this, uh, this unsafe region? And the answer is yes, uh, you could expose this as a swap device. 
So you could expose your half of your memory as a swap device. So you know, whenever you run out of memory here in the safe region, you could start using the unsafe region, right? Um, but you have to be careful because now you're using also this memory, right? So somebody may try to hammer using the swap area, right? So you have to be careful. So, and the way we did this, so the question is that how would you protect this uh, uh, safe and unsafe region? By hammering the swap, you could potentially trigger bit flip in the safe region, but also the attacker could just access memory and trigger corruptions in the swap. So we need to do something about this. So to protect the, uh, the safe region, we have to make sure that the swap is not accessed very frequently. And here we use the cache to make sure that uh, these accesses don't happen very fast. Uh, and for protecting the unsafe region, we do integrity checks. So whenever we, get a, we want to read something back from the swap, we make sure that this integrity check uh, matches. Otherwise, you know, we tell the user somebody is trying to do a raw hammer attack. Uh, so this is all quite complicated, perhaps. So let me show you a life of a page uh, in the Zebram world. So here you have your safe memory, and you have a page. You know, your browser has allocated the page, right? And it is happy. But since your browser is Chrome, you need, it needs suddenly more memory that you have available, right? So this needs to go to the swap, right? So it first goes to the cache. It stays there for a while. And then suddenly the cache is also full, you know, because you opened another tab. So it needs to now really move to the swap. So, and then to do that, we first create a hash of this, uh, uh, of this page. And now the hash is here. And at some point, you know, Chrome needs this page back because, you know, you go back to the page that you opened two days ago and you want to read it again. So it needs to, to take this page back. Uh, so, but in the meantime, an attacker has gone and triggered the bit flip in this page, right? Because this is possible, right? So you, you now need to somehow be able to fix this because this is in your swap. Now, of course, now that you try to read this page back, you can uh, check the hash, either raise an alarm, or you know you could also do some ECC and try to fix it. Of course, the difference here is now that you also, it's a software ECC, so you're much more free, free in the algorithm that you choose. You could also use a hash to detect a cryptographic hash when this happens. And then, you know, if you do ECC, uh, you could actually fix this, or maybe you can raise an alarm. But the point of the story is that at the end, you get your correct data back, or you get an indication that something has gone wrong is something that you didn't have before. So this was uh, quite a lot of work, right? Because we are changing the memory management in the, in the operating system, right? In the hypervisor. So at the end, it was a change of about six, 7,000 lines of code. And it actually worked. So we ran a bunch of benchmarks on this. So this is a standard spec benchmark. Uh, what you can find out is that on average, the overhead is not so high. It's a few percentage points. Uh, but in some cases, the overhead is actually quite high. It's like uh, 2x. Actually, in corner cases, it could be even more. And the reason for that is that, for example, this benchmark allocates a lot of memory. So if your active memory is quite large, then you know you start hammering this swap. You start going to this swap quite often, right? Then things become slower. So this is also some price that you have to pay if you want to have uh, security. Speaking of security, uh, here we have all the bit flips that we could trigger before. Uh, but here now, we could, trigger, we could detect all of them while we had Zebram in place. So we have now a protection that doesn't rely on disabling feature. We could actually do this uh, in a principle. Yeah, so this was the first uh, comprehensive and compatible Rohammer protection that, uh, that, uh, that, we, uh, that we developed. So this was DRAM. So I'm going to talk very briefly. So I don't know how much time I have left. OK, maybe 10 more minutes. I will talk about uh, these uh, CPU attacks that we've been doing, because I think these are also quite exciting. Uh, all right, OK, so I mostly focus on the attack part of this. Uh, so you know, in the traditional cache attacks, so this was also something that people have done uh, in uh, 2000, uh, let's say from 2005, right? And this is also something that uh, the talk briefly mentioned in, in the morning, where you have you know, a victim software, a victim core that is running some, for example, a cryptographic routine. And then based on you know, whether the key of the, uh, of the victim is 0 or 1, you, know, you execute some code or the other. But the point of the matter is that depending on what the victim does, uh, there will be different uh, cache lines uh, that are being accessed that will be in your, for example, shared last level cache. And then the attacker could later go and figure out which locations in the cache could examine the state of the last level cache and figure out which cache lines were read by the victim and brought into memory. And using this, 
the attacker could then figure out was the bit zero or one. So this is a very basic you know, cache attack. So people knew about this already for a long time. Uh, but the idea here is that the software that is here, you're attacking software basically, right? Because the software is making uh, control decisions based on a secret bit, right? Um, but here, so we started thinking, okay, so people have been looking into attacking software. Can we actually start using these attacks against the hardware itself? This was the first uh, uh, thing that we tried. So here, this is the first attack that we actually tried. So where we are trying to attack the CPU itself. And then by CPU here, I mean the MMU, the memory management unit uh, in the CPU. So who here knows what an MMU is? Hey, okay, well, quite a few. So for those of you who don't, you know, <laughs> Uh, oftentimes, uh, your CPU is always uh, trying to access memory, right? So your CPU is crunching on numbers, and then there is data in memory. And uh, what we have done in the past uh, 30, 40 years is uh, what we call, we do virtualization. We try to uh, make it easier for programs to execute, and then to make it easier, we give the illusion that a program has access to all the memory in the universe. And then in reality, this is not true. And then we have this MMU that figures out exactly what the program is trying to do and translate this address into the actual memory that you have allocated by, uh, by the program. So this is what the MMU does. It always translates these virtual addresses to these physical addresses. Um, and so one thing uh, that one mitigation and defense, this is the first line of defense that we have now in uh, all of our computing systems, like for example in the browser, uh, and uh, what we do is that we try to randomize the location of many objects in the system. So if there is a vulnerability, if you know that, okay, so you know, your cookie or your credit card information is at that location in memory and it is always there, then it is quite easy to just read it, right? But if you randomize it and put it somewhere in memory, it becomes quite hard. And if the attacker makes a guess and the guess is wrong, uh, wrong and then the whole system would crash, right? So this is the first line of defense. It's called address space layout randomization, or ASLR. So the, these pointers the, are now secret. They're randomized, and the attacker is not supposed to know where these pointers are. And this is what the MMU does, right? So the MMU takes this secret virtual address and finds the, uh, the physical address. And it does so by a process that is called uh, page table walk. So you have these data structures that the CPU would, would uh, access that would uh, allow it to find out where it should go to find out the actual location whenever you do an access to a virtual address. So you know, I will not go through the details of this, but the idea is that you have a register that would tell you where your page table is, and then you know you go there, and then you take some parts of your virtual address, and you find out the offset, and there you would find like a pointer to the next level, and then you take another part of your virtual address, and you go and find another pointer, and then you do that a couple of times, then you find out finally at the very end, at the leaf of the tree that you're walking, this is the tree that you're walking, right? At the leaf of the tree, you will find out the actual physical address for that virtual address. So what we find out, what we found out when we were looking into this ANC attack was that going through this uh, access, so because the MMU is accessing memory, right? Very much like your program does. We found out that this accesses actually leaves a trace also in your CPU cache, right? And then by examining where in the CPU cache uh, the MMU has been accessing, you could find out these offsets, right? Whether this, is, this was the 200 offset from the beginning of the page or whether it was the 300 and so on. Uh, but the thing is that now this offset is potentially the secret, right? So these are parts of this virtual address that is secret. And so using this attack, then you can find out actually what the virtual address is. And the scary part about this is that since this is something, it's just your basically just doing memory accesses, right? This is something that all the applications in the system do. And uh, so does your browser. And this is what we did. We did, we reproduced the attack in the browser, so we wrote it in JavaScript. And if you've never done microarchitectural attack in JavaScript, I recommend that you don't. <laughs> it's quite painful. But on the other hand, this is also closest that I've come to the matrix, right? So because we were looking into these uh, patterns and trying to find out, you know, whether this is mimicking an MMU behavior or not. So we're always looking at whether this is a staircase pattern or not, or whether this is going back and forth or not. So we're always looking at this and then trying to figure out what we did wrong. We also didn't really have a debugger, right? Because your CPU doesn't have a debugger, right? So <laughs> you try to uh, go through a lot of pain to figure this out. 
But then you, at the end, once you do all of that, you find out the actual pointer. So here we had the data pointer and the code pointer in JavaScript. And this is the information that you're not supposed to have in JavaScript, right? Because uh, with this information, now we know all the objects in the memory. So as soon as we have a very basic uh, bug, we could exploit it to, uh, to get this information. So this brings the security back to the 90s, more or less. Uh, so we tested this on many architectures. So as I said, this is a very fundamental thing, right? All the CPUs do MMUs and translate virtual addresses to physical addresses, at least the ones that we use, right? So everything that we tried, I think we tried things from back in 2008, we went up to CPUs that were re released in 2017, which was when this research was published, and they were all vulnerable. Uh, yes, so, and then there was a lot of response. So Apple uh, did something to change the allocation. There were a lot of jitters in, uh, introduced in the timer because we were doing timing, right? Now, if you make the timers very slow, then you cannot do this. Um, and yeah, so people also liked this, and there was uh, some awards. So this was, so we were doing this back in 2017, but we were not the only one, right? So it's always like whenever you're looking into this uh, new topic, new area, a lot of other groups are also looking into this. So we were focusing on the MMU, and at the same time, people were, were focusing on other components, right, in the CPU. And one of these components is the speculative execution unit, right? Then the secret that the MMU has is the virtual address, right, that you don't know. And the secret that the speculative execution has is the entire address space of the program, so all the data. So here, the impact was, of course, much, much higher, right? So you could leak all the data that you have uh, in, the, in the address space. And I will very briefly explain how, this, how one variant of this attack works. Uh, so here, the idea is that you have a victim process. Uh, for the sake of this explanation, assume that this is your kernel, right, that writes some secret into memory, right? Uh, and this is from a high privilege, and then you have your attacker process, which is running on a lower privilege. It's a poor user process, not having any privileges. It would try to access this secret. Right? It writes a point, it creates a pointer uh, that points to this kernel address. Now, if the attacker would try to read this pointer, you would get an exception, right? Because you are not allowed to do that. So you get a page fault, and then you know you get a segmentation fault, and then your process dies, right? Uh, but what these uh, researchers figured out was that uh, at the microarchitecture level, this instruction actually executes. Quite, it goes quite far in the CPU pipeline. And then you could look at the effect of this instruction after the exception has been triggered. And by looking at the effect, you would actually figure out what this secret was. And this is done via a technique which we call a covert channel. And I will very briefly try to explain how this works. So the idea is that you have an array. Uh, right, and this array has multiple entries, right? And uh, oftentimes, you know, parts of this array could be in your L1 cache, which is like really fast. You know, caches are fast, and DRAM is really slow, right? So what the attacker would do is flushing these locations. So you flush, so that every time you would access it, it would be really, really slow. So if you know you would try to access it, everything would run really, really slow. But now you flushed it, and it is not uh, accessed, and then you would execute such an instruction. So where you have this pointer in the kernel, right, point to the kernel, and then you would put it as an index to this array, right? I'm sorry if you cannot really see this. Uh, it's just an array with the pointer uh, dereference as, as an index to this, uh, this array. And now you would, of course, get the exception because you were not allowed to do this. But at the, at the microarchitectural level, this instruction actually executes. And then one of these, okay, the value of this pointer is going to be used to cache one of these elements of this array, right? So if we do now the measurement, we will see that, you know, maybe one element of the array is slow, maybe another one of the elements is fast, and maybe the last one is also slow. So given this information, what is the value that the pointer is pointing to? Somebody? One. Okay, yes, you're right. So this means that the value is one. So this is how the covert channel basically works. So using this, you can point this to very different addresses in the kernel, and then you could figure out all these values. So, you know, this is not good, right? So your CPU is not supposed to do that, right? You should not be able to use this to leak uh, arbitrary information from the lower privileges in the system. So, you know, there was this whole industry response, how can we fix this? And almost all of the fixes that, was, that were proposed was limiting this pointer. So you make sure that this pointer cannot point to a secret. 
So you know they move the kernel, they, the kernel completely away from the other space of any processes that you have in the system. And in this way, the, the attacker cannot point the secret anymore, uh, to uh, point the pointer to the secret that you have in the system. And this uh, mitigated, this stopped all of these attacks, at least this instance of attacks. That was perhaps the most uh, dangerous one. So then, of course, the question that uh, we were asking were, are these mitigations enough? Can maybe the attacker do something else? And uh, this brings me to this last part. And uh, the answer was, unfortunately, no. You know, you cannot just fix here and there a little bit in software and hope that the problem goes away. Right? So this, this is not how it works with this software attack. So this uh, led us to the discovery of Riddle uh, that showed that you can, despite these mitigations, you can still do this type of attacks. And I'm not going to explain much. It's actually very simple. I'm going to tell you that we found this by mistake because we don't know how to write code. <laughs> uh, and then what we found out is that if you have an invalid pointer, it still leaks information. Right? So you know all the efforts were, making sh were to make sure this pointer cannot point to the secret. And what we realized is that if we have just a null pointer, we can still leak information from it. So this was like, you know, this was like, it took us like, you know, we were banging our head trying to understand what is going on because we did not expect this. Right? And uh, after, you know, reading, I don't know how many manuals, uh, this poor PhD student that we have, I think he read maybe, maybe 200 manuals to try to figure out what is going on. Uh, but what we found out, you know, now we know, but back then we didn't, right? That we have uh, a lot of uh, CPU buffers, right? So you have the caches that people leak, have leaked from, but then to get to these caches, your data goes through various buffers that you have in your CPU. You have a store buffers, you have line field buffers, and these uh, buffers do not have addressing information. And then what the CPU does is that it, if it observes a fault, it would forward whatever information is available in one of these buffers. So if you get a null pointer, you get an exception, but this load continues, tries to read the last entry that has been written to one of these buffers. And uh, you know, so basically the secret is now here, and then you can read it again uh, with a covert channel. And now this, is, this was also quite bad, right? Because if you think of security, right, when you're designing operating systems, you always associate security with an address, right? So you say, you, you know, for example, this part of the memory is for the kernel, right? This, card, this part of the memory is for the user. And when you say this part of the memory, you already mean these addresses, right? But now you can leak without worrying about addresses, right? Whenever you say this part of memory is executable and this part of the memory is not executable, you're also, again, talking about this part of memory, which is also an address, right? So everything that we think of when we talk about security is somehow associated with an address. And now here is a primitive that allows you to leak without any address, which means that you could arbitrarily leak, leak across the board, bypass all the mitigations, and leak from any security domain that you have in the system. So I have a little demo. Uh, so this was uh, a bit difficult to exploit, just because of the fact that uh, it is, so it's like a fire hose, right? So you're leaking and you get everything. Everything that the CPU does, you leak, right? And then it becomes quite hard to actually find the information that you want to leak. So in the beginning, we, we, uh, the uh, exploit that we had, you know, would take like 24 hours. So the aim of the exploit is to leak the root hash of uh, the system. So that's the aim. And it took us 24 hours, right? But then later on, you know, uh, I, was, I have a course that I teach these things, right? And then the students try to optimize the things that we have created. And then one of the students managed to bring the, this down from 24 hours to only four seconds. <laughs> so, you know, Intel was telling us that, you know, we don't need to worry about this. This is not a really practical attack. And then, you know, the student showed that it actually is. And, you know, if uh, it takes uh, one of the master students to do this, uh, uh, you know, in, in two months, uh, I wonder, you know, how long it takes somebody who's a security researcher. Uh, so here, uh, okay, maybe. but this runs so fast that, uh, you know, it's not, so basically you're running the attack, and then the idea is that you give it this prefix, a uh, root, and in one, one core, in one thread, you're executing the passwd command, which is bringing in the entry of the root hash into the buffer. Right? And then in the other one, you're doing this attack, you know, triggering this null pointer accesses over and over again. Then you try to filter out what it is that is the root hash. And you start by the beginning because you know that the beginning starts with root, and then you try to stitch bits of information after that. Uh, and you know, it, so it starts first from the beginning because you can leak at each point one cache line, and then at the end, it starts to leak from the end. So you start because the end is also known. 
So it starts from the beginning, leaks 64 bytes, and then it starts from the end and leaks the rest of the, the, the bits that you want to leak. So here, and then, you know, in the beginning, you know root. If I let this continue. And at the end, you know, you know that at the end, it ends with 9999, right? So, and then you basically try to leak from the end. I mean, this is not necessary. You could also do some st statistical analysis, but this way, it is quite easy to actually do the attack. So, and then she finished it, and then here it shows that it took uh, only four seconds. Okay, doesn't work. But yeah, so the end, he prints the, the actual uh, root hash. And this was on one of our clusters, so we actually had to go and change all of our passwords. Uh, because now suddenly the students had access to our root hash, which is not, not, not good. OK, so I'm going to quickly finish. Uh, I should have probably finished five minutes ago. But... Anyway, so we tried this also on many Intel CPUs. Uh, and we found that uh, you know, uh, many of them uh, were vulnerable. Intel promised that uh, you know, they released this. Uh, so while we were doing this research, a week after we submitted our paper, they came up and said, we have, uh, we have released a CPU that fixes all of these issues in hardware, right? And then we were like, okay, let's try this. So we bought this, you know, takes two months to arrive uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and then we found out that, uh, unfortunately, it still is vulnerable to this class of attacks. So it shows that, and then we did more research and we figured out that they tried to fix specifically this attack that was discovered before and not try to fix the problem at the core. So it shows that really these uh, mitigations, uh, you need to think about them a little bit more. Uh, AMD systems were not affected by this. So we were under one year, one year of uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So we couldn't talk about this for one year. It's also quite frustrating that you're not able to talk about your research for one year. Uh, but at the end, they gave us $100,000, uh, which did not go to any of our pockets. It just went to the university, right? So at the end, we didn't get much out of this uh, embargo. OK, and then there are like other defenses that we've also developed. Uh, so one of the uh, uh, assessments that we did resulted in disabling SMT in OpenBSD. And this was quite good because you know, with SMT, these type of attacks become much, much easier. And then we also have uh, research uh, other primitives to actually make the partitioning a little bit more secure. If you're interested, you can find these things uh, uh, you know, online. OK, so to conclude, uh, so. We think in Amsterdam at a FUSEC that hardware is the new software, right? Because every three months, two months, you see a new, new uh, exploitation possibility. But the problem here is that it is much, much harder to fix, right? Uh, then spot mitigations, the one that I explained, are very costly. They take one year to develop, and then they're not even sometimes uh, secure. And so we need to start you know, doing more research. So I, I see that you know, this is just the start, and then we need to invest a lot more uh, trying to build uh, uh, mitigations, better mitigations. And yes, yeah, so I gave you now an overview of a lot of research. You know, I was just, you know, uh, just there. There were a lot of people who did most of the actual hard work, and I would like to thank them. And uh, this is it. And, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer.